Moisè. I want to reach out from the grave. Well, that definitely was not my intro. Everybody out in Radio Land listening, we're not going to have an intro today because when I pushed it, I didn't have it loaded, and it loaded the next thing that was in mind. So uh, I guess welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio. This is your host, Royce the Redneck Radio Man, and joining me today is going to be Dr. Bob Curran, and we're going to discuss <coughs> actually some on two of his books. One is A Haunted Mind about H.P. Lovecraft. He's going to go inside the dark and twisted world of H.P. Lovecraft. And the other one is American Vampires. And folks, pardon my voice. <clears throat> I'm suffering a little bit of weather right now. I hope for it to be better by the next show. Just kind of uh, work with me and bear with me through this. Um, we're going to probably discuss the American Vampires a little bit more than H.P. Lovecraft. And I said we go ahead and kind of dive right into this. I'm uh, starting a little bit out behind because I well, wasn't expecting to go quite this route, and I didn't expect my intro to be uh, unloaded. I kind of messed it up myself. Uh, Bob, i got to tell you, it's great to have you back on my show. Um, I hope you had a great holiday season. Royce, uh, a very uh, happy new year to both yourself, your family, and all your listeners. It's great to be back, and uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you. I I hope that your throat clears up, and uh, if you want, try a bit of uh, honey and lemon, or if you don't have that, a bit of bootleg whiskey. Um, that will either cure you or leave you that you don't care what you sound like. Well, <laughs> uh, that really sounds like you have some fun out of it. <laughs> okay, I'll look into that. Actually, it's what you're describing. I think you should. <clears throat> what you're describing sounds like a hot toddy. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You yeah. <laughs> or several hot toddies. <laughs> I'm going to definitely look into that. They put a wild turkey 101 mixed with a little uh, honey and uh, what else? Hot water? Uh, oh, uh, hot water, squeeze a lemon. Works every time. Gotcha. All righty. My wife knows how to make those. Uh, Bob, about the uh, one on HP Lovecraft. Okay. So, here, you've done this one a little bit uh, here a while back, didn't you? Sorry? I said you did the uh, one about H.P. Lovecraft here a while back, didn't you? I did, yeah, I, I, I did. Um, Career Press asked me to do something on H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, and uh, we took a look from a slightly different angle because one of the questions that was frequently asked, and I see you ask it on, on, on your uh, headings for the show, um, that did he have um, access to some sort of secret folklore which is denied to other PR uh, uh, so, uh, uh, hidden texts which are denied to some other people. So what we did was we began to look at uh, uh, some of the folklore um, uh, which he might have had uh, access to. Now, uh, personally, I don't think that he had access to all sorts of weird and wonderful books which uh, none of the rest of us have access to. But uh, I think he was well aware of some of the folklore and some of uh, the bits and pieces of uh, old texts because his grandfather, um, Whipple Phillips, who lived in Providence, had a library, um, uh, which the young uh, Howard Philip Lovecraft, uh, as he was growing up, uh, had access to. So he was uh, familiar with possibly Greek, Roman, and possibly some Arabic myth. And these influenced some of uh, the stories which he wrote. So his father wrote as well. Uh, he had uh, uh, access to uh, 
also uh, a, a number of, of strands of mythology. So we begin to look at some of, of, of the mythologies uh, he uh, looked at. Uh, however, Lovecraft himself was, uh, I uh, could say, a, a rather strange individual. Uh, he always considered himself to be an outsider. And perhaps this has given uh, the idea that he had access to certain right. realms which lay outside uh, the normal field of uh, human experience. Yeah, and you were writing about the fact in the book that he did have access to uh, certainly some tomes, but not as many as, say, some people might think he might have. Well, uh, I, we don't know actually what was in his grand, uh, on the full extent of the books that was in his grandfather's library. But uh, we do know that he looked at Greek and Roman. So we lo we looked at some of the uh, the, the Greek and Roman uh, uh, things that he uh, looked at. For, uh, for example, uh, the idea of uh, the god Nodens, who appears in certain um, uh, Roman texts and in certain Roman inscriptions. For instance, uh, in some places in England, there are um, uh, some of the ruins uh, which were visited by uh, Lovecraft. Never visited these himself, but uh, he knew of people who had. For example, the writer Arthur Machen, uh, whose work he uh, impressed Lovecraft greatly. Um, who had visited uh, some of these places, and there were inscriptions to uh, the god uh, Nodens, uh, who may well have been uh, a, a variant of the sea god Poseidon, uh, who was venerated by both the ancient Greeks and as Neptune by the ancient Romans. Uh, we know that he uh, had re read uh, books possibly on uh, the notion of the jinn, uh, the Arab um, sort of spirits who lived in, in the West and who had uh, been um, um, uh, contacted by people known as Kahins, K-A-H-I-N-S, uh, who were sort of like soothsayers and who dealt with the jinn and who were sometimes driven mad by the jinn, by their contact, because the jinn were very, very alien. The jinn, as I say, were spirits who lived in places like Wadi Rum in southern Jordan or in down in, on the Yemen coastline in the Gulf of Arabia. And this may have translated into something, let's say, like Abdul al Hazarad. Uh, the mad Arab who had come from Sana'a in Yemen and who had visited um, the uh, nameless city, Iram, of the Pillars. Now, certainly he would have possibly read about um, Solomon uh, who had uh, quelled the jinn or had, made the, uh, who had uh, subdued the jinn and uh, took over their city. Um, the jinn were supposed to have built a great city um, uh, down in southern Jordan, um, which is now the site of the Valley of the Moon uh, at Wadi Rum, uh, uh, down from uh, the Gulf of uh, Arabia. So uh, he would have known about these and have... Um, put them into some of his stories and possibly these uh, this is the site of uh, uh, um, Iram, the city of the pillars, which may have been based on, on an actual city which uh, vanished uh, in the, I think it was about the 12th century, it was on the Frankincense Trail um, and it was known as Ubar uh, but it simply fell into a hole in the ground. Uh, it was built over a subterranean lake, which um, the inhabitants of the city used as a well. And as the uh, water uh, as the water level went down, the the roof of uh, the subterranean lake 
uh, on which the city was built became weak and the city simply collapsed. Wow. Uh, but it became a great myth, the, the myth of the uh, of, uh, of the great trading city of Ubar, which it vanished. Uh, and that could have translated into Iram uh, uh, and certainly Lovecraft knew about Wadi Rum and places like that in the Arabian Desert. Um, in fact, um, I think Lovecraft also adopted the name as a child uh, in his play of Abdul al Hazarad, though nobody knows where the name came from. Yeah, I kind of got the impression while I was reading the book that from your portrayal of Lovecraft and his motivations in his writings was that his writings was a uh, a reflection of... Um, Kind of like his escape land from real life, uh, life that he wouldn't say maybe the most pleased with in the world. And he'd kind of go to these other places and he'd write about them, uh, sort of like, did I kind of misinterpret that? No, we are quite right. Um, I, uh, as I said, uh, at the head of the program, uh, from my uh, personal perspective, Lovecraft may have been a, a, a rather weird individual or a yeah. rather strange individual. Uh, and I know that Lovecraft considered himself to be a, an outsider. Uh, he, uh, for example, uh, he didn't uh, actually work apart from one week in his life. Uh, he didn't. Uh, he may not have considered uh, work for him, and he lived uh, almost in penury. He all also had a whole number of, I suspect, inner demons with which he wrestled from time to time. For instance, he was. Um, he didn't consider himself particularly good-looking, uh, although he was quite passable. But he didn't consider himself um, uh, sort of good-looking. And therefore, all these things, uh, this translates itself into sort of mo- monstrous figures in his uh, writings. He also struggled with the notion of madness uh, and was terrified of becoming mad. Both his um, mother and father had died uh, in a sanitarium. Uh, his father oh, wow. had actually been a uh, mad. We suspect that it was uh, through a form of syphilis. So there was some uh, history of uh, mental history through his family tree. There was. Uh, 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 there was. And uh, I think that Lovecraft himself was uh, terrified of being mad and uh, considered himself uh, from uh, at various times on the edge of madness. Uh, 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 we do know that from time to time he contemplated suicide, uh, going so far as to carry a, a small bottle of poison around with him. Yeah, I read that in the book. Uh, 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 so he may well have suffered from great periods dep- of depression and periods of uh, all uh, of great uncertainty about himself, and that's the sort of demons that he was wrestling with. And this, uh, those are the sort of demons that he was putting into his books because uh, there's a current theme, uh, underlying theme, in many of his stories about an underlying madness. Uh, w- within some of his characters and uh, and the mm. fear of madness and and um, people who had been mad who had lived in various places and uh, if you look at um, some of the places he created for example Dunwich for example Innsmouth um, which some uh, claim that he based on on real places and I, I, I and I would not doubt that there were various uh, uh, reclusive and inbred communities uh, living in the late eighteen uh, hundreds and uh, beginning of the uh, uh, sorry uh, beginning of the, uh, the late nineteen uh, hundreds and beginning of the uh, sorry uh, beginning of the twentieth century. Uh, in places like New England, but um, uh, he uh, was terrified of uh, uh, of this madness, and this translates into some of the places that he wrote about, with mm. sort of 
inbred communities, uh, old people in the community who were considered mad or crazy or something like that. And this reflects something of the fears that he had and uh, the uh, things that terrified himself and the demons that he struggled with. Yeah, um, I'm sitting here listening to you and I read the book and the thought occurs to me that he might have suffered a similar fate to his parents if it had not been for his uh, writing. He could well have been and uh, and, uh, I think he did uh, find, uh, and this is open to interpretation, of course, he did find uh, normal human relationships slightly difficult. Um, so that considering himself an outsider, he, I mean, he had a great deal of acquaintances uh, uh, with whom he communicated by voluminous, Letters. Some of these letters read, uh, are reaching uh, almost a hundred pages, uh, which he sent out. Uh, but um, he seems to uh, have uh, only on on certain occasions, and uh, he was by no means, uh, I don't think, a recluse. But he uh, and he did venture out, and he ventured to the various places. He never ventured outside the United States. But um, he um, found it very difficult to go into new places, uh, new and modern places. When he lived for a while in New York with his wife, uh, because he did marry, uh, although the marriage broke down. Uh, he lived uh, in New York. He found New York incredibly oppressive. He found New York full of uh, strange, strange to him, people. Um, and he found it, uh, and I uh, don't want to labor the point too much, but uh, he did find it full of foreigners, uh, which uh, he, found, uh, he found their ways uh, very strange and very, uh, I, I suspect, very frightening because he was unfamiliar with them. So uh, you're quite right, Royce. He, uh, uh, some of these things could have preyed uh, very strongly on his mind and might have uh, uh, actually from time, and he was certainly um, subject to fits of depression in, in, in which uh, he thought himself of uh, very little worth. Uh, and uh, it could have served to tip him over the point uh, to where his, uh, particularly his mother, who seems to have been a very highly strong and very nervous person, uh, to where she... Yeah, I kind of got the impression he was. <clears throat> he also <clears throat> seemed to be um, not exactly the kind of person that would win the Saint of the Year award. I don't think so, but uh, then there are people who say that he was an, uh, he was a very pleasant person, and I have no uh, reason to doubt that, that he could uh, be good conversation and that he had uh, a, a number of friends. But uh, I still think um, perhaps, and it uh, reflects more on me than it does on him, that he was. A, a very singular and very rather strange person. Um, uh, I, I think that if he and I had met up over the, the, the dinner table, um, I would have found him a wee bit difficult. Yeah, but you're the kind of guy, from my knowledge, at least when I've known you, that you're very amiable. You can get along with almost anybody, it seems like. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I try on my best. I, I have another side to me, Rice, where uh, I have to work in the community. Uh, I, I do things for the Northern Ireland community and work in the community. And you have to be like that. You have to, particularly in Northern Ireland, you have to get on with uh, whoever <laughs> sits across the table from you. So maybe he and I would have got on. I, 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 I don't know. I think you could have, but hey, it's one man's opinion. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, 
uh, one of the things I was going to mention is you didn't just write about H.P. Lovecraft, and I want to move on here in a minute to the uh, American Vampires, but before we do, I wanted to mention and let you uh, tell us real quick about the fact that what you went into it, not only his background, but the background of uh, some of the writings he either may or may not have had access to or may have been an influence. Uh, you mentioned a lot of forbidden works, and uh, you got quite a history of his, um, you know, like uh, a bunch of grimoires, in other words. Um, are these things that are hard to find nowadays? Uh, some of them are. Uh, if, if you could see where I'm sitting at the minute, Royce, you would see that all around me I have all sorts of uh, uh, books and, and stuff. My wife always says, don't bring, if people call, don't bring them into your study because you have all sorts of books there and, and they might look at you very askance. Uh, some of these are all, all sorts of things. I have uh, stuff on werewolves. I have stuff on, va- I have books on vampires. I have books on fairies. I have books oh, yeah. on night creatures. I have books called Hostage to the Devil. I'm just looking across uh, uh, the, uh, uh, these sort of things. I have uh, Abandoned Houses in, of Ireland. I have uh, the Ghost Stories of M.R. James. I have Medieval Outlaws. I have st- uh, uh, Real Ghost Spirits, uh, Real Ghosts and Restless Spirits and Haunted Places. So there you are. That's the sort of stuff that's on my, my bookshelf. So some of them, uh, some of them are, and uh, I, I have old photostat uh, papers here. So some of them are difficult to track down, uh, and some of them I have got through interlibrary loans uh, and things like that. But uh, what I've done is I've looked at some of the uh, uh, some of these books, and uh, and I give. Uh, at the start of the forbidden books, because uh, you mentioned the forbidden books, a sort of uh, thumbnail guide to grimoires and stuff like that. I have a number of grimoires sitting on, on witchcraft and magic in, Nord- in the Nordic Middle Ages and stuff like that, which deals with old. Uh, I have a copy of uh, the Red Skin book by. Um, Primi Nicholson, who was the Bishop of Holar, who was the most evil man in Iceland, because I'm working in Iceland at the minute. So, um, uh, yes, some of these are very hard to track down, and some of them I have, and some of them I've got through uh, both uh, university and through church uh, loans and things like that. Mm, yeah, because I don't see those kind of books um, like you're referring to. In your everyday library, for example. Oh, yeah, yeah, you won't get them in the libraries. And uh, if you go into some libraries, particularly here in Northern Ireland, uh, if you, and you ask them, you get very, very strange looks. So uh, just be careful if you ask for them. You can sometimes get them through universities, uh, but it depends. Some of the universities don't keep them in, in, their, uh, in their collections. So this is uh, research into this area would be uh, a little tricky. Uh, uh, well, uh, research oh, it could be a, 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 a bit tricky. You can get pamphlets, and uh, I've got a number of, uh, of pamphlets. For a, a, a example, we looked at some of the church things about Lovecraft because uh, there were a number of churchmen wrote about Lovecraft over the years. Oh, I'm and sure there was. You shouldn't <laughs> believe you shouldn't be reading them. Uh, some people, uh, uh, and some people claimed uh, from the political end that he was a Nazi or he had Aryan sympathies or, and things like that, or that he was a They suspected uh, he was Carly's uh, brother. <laughs> quite frankly, I don't believe that he, uh, I don't personally believe that he was uh, a racist or, or I think he had certain views on certain things. Uh, um, uh, nor do I believe that he was attached to political organization. But you get that, and you get pamphlets, so you have to take a, a, a look at them from time to time. And uh, I have a 
set of magazines here, uh, not look at some of his stuff. So, uh, if, but uh, as I say, was I built those up over a whole number of years. So, um, and some of them are quite old. I uh, bought some of them in second-hand bookshops, but um, you, can, you can build it up over the years. But uh, it takes you to know what you're looking for, I suppose. But uh, other people look at other things, and uh, other people will have different views about Lovecraft uh, and about vampires and about uh, all sorts of other things. Okay. Uh, Maggie in chat wanted me to ask you about the Codex uh, Gigas also known as the Devil's Bible, once owned by Queen Christina of Sweden, she thinks? There was a codex. Yes, there are a number of codexes uh, which have come out. Uh, there, I think there may have been. I'm not familiar with the codex that your listener refers to. Uh, I have a number of old codexes. For, instance, for example, the Codex Hereticum which uh, is supposedly a facsimile of uh, a a codex which is held by the Vatican. Uh, Now, this is supposedly a book which is similar to the Malleus Maleficarum, uh, which I have a copy somewhere, uh, which uh, was written uh, in the late 15th century, around about 1484, by uh, two inquisitors, um, Heinrich Kramer, uh, Kramer and Jacobus Springer, uh, under the authority of Pope Innocent the Eighth, I think. Uh, but there have been a number of books which have come out, and there's the Codex Hereticum, there's the Devil's Bible, there's uh, the Bible uh, of uh, Leipzig, uh, or the, uh, the, the Leipzig Bible written in uh, 1450, uh, which is, uh, 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 I'm just looking at it here, um, which deals with Solomon um, uh, and makes references to various demons. It's an, uh, it's an older Bible in the King James authorized version. Uh, you have uh, uh, Fidelio de Stampa's Satane, which is produced about 1480. Uh, which is about devils and things like that. So you have all these ancient codexes which uh, exist. And uh, although I'm not familiar with uh, the specific one which you've referred to, uh, there are a whole number of, 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 of such things uh, written either by churchmen or by political leaders for various uh, political or religious agendas. Okay. Now, I was going to say, why don't we move on to the American vampires, but before we do, I meant to mention earlier that they want to know more about you. They can go to your blog at drbobcurian.blogspot.com and he's got all his uh, plans coming up, books, uh, contact information, uh, things you might need to know about them sitting right there on his site. You can get his book at any Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or major bookseller. You can also click on it on my site. It'll take you right to Amazon where you can buy it. And I'll be there in my archives. I'll be moving it off the front page uh, tomorrow, but I'll be replacing it with the uh, one with the actual show in it. <laughs> That's fine. That's grand. Okay. Hang on just one second. Also, for those of you that would like to call in and ask a question, the number is 832-632-7904. Please feel free. And about the American vampires, i got to tell you, I had a lot of trouble putting this one down in particular. Uh, <laughs> there's so much about the American vampire that I did not know. And the only thing I really did know was that there was a legend that says that uh, the Count Dracula got started with uh, Vladimir, known as Vladimir the Impaler. And he, he was uh, part of the Dagobert family. And it traces that, back to uh, well, that is King true. Roby. That is true. Um, the 
um, uh, you're looking at a f- uh, sort of 15th century uh, Valachian uh, nobleman. Now, Valachia was uh, a, a small country in Eastern Europe, which corresponds roughly to part of Romania today. Uh, and uh, he was a uh, Dracula, or Vlad Tepes, Vlad the Impaler, was a voivode. Uh, that means a local ruler. Uh, the name Dracula, or Dracula, uh, means uh, son of the dragon, or little dragon. Um, and it was an order of chivalry which was given to Vlad's father. He was Vlad the Third. His father was Vlad the uh, Second, and had been given by a gentleman called John Hunyadi, who was uh, the White Knight of the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, uh, Empire, uh, who had given him the Order of the Dragon. And uh, Dracula became uh, Dracula, or a Little Dragon. But uh, the novel itself actually is an Irish novel. Uh, it was written by an Irishman, uh, Bram Stoker, um, and it deals actually with uh, what was going on in Ireland. Uh, uh, Dracula is a nobleman. You, have, you had prob- problems with the nobility in Ireland at the time. Um, there was the land question. Uh, Dracula has to sleep in his own soil, and that goes into Fenton Lawler's Irish land for Irish people. And you had uh, things about, uh, about uh, the suffrage of women, uh, translates into Mina Harker, Lucy Westerna, and you had um, 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 problems with, dare I say, Americans. Um, and uh, that translates into uh, some of the uh, American character whose name escapes me at the minute, but um, he also appears. Now, what I argue is that uh, the idea of the vampire always reflects the culture and the problems of the culture in which uh, one finds themselves. Right. And you and, did a good uh, job of it. You know, showing that in the different states in America. Uh, that's right. Uh, and, and that's what I was coming on to say, Royce, because where else would you get such a broad spread of cultures and um, traditions as in America? And that's why I uh, picked America, because you have, uh, because over here in Northern Ireland, uh, and uh, I think in Britain as well, we tend to think of America as sort of all, uh, almost New York uh, uh, and, and places like that, or San Francisco, or places like that. But, uh, I mean, you have a wide spread of cultures and traditions right across America. You have German, you have French, you have Spanish, you have Creole. Uh, you have all sorts of uh, you have Portuguese. You have all sorts of um, um, sort of traditions and cultures and backgrounds, all spread together. And these people have settled in America. You have also Native Americans, um, and uh, all these have become sort of intertwined uh, because all of these settlers and all of these Native Americans have. Uh, had their own nightmares, which they have all brought with them or shared, and they have all become almost intertwined in a sort of rich tapestry. I'm glad you find uh, it <laughs> difficult to put the book down because that rice makes it all worthwhile. Um, yeah, and you know, for such a wide variety of places you got in here, and the different beliefs about each one. I noticed that many of these shared common themes or common threads, uh, you know, um, vampires, uh, shapeshifters, witches, uh, you know, a lot of them had some of the same beliefs from state to state, uh, even though they had some differences. Well, uh, 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 that's true. They, they're, they're both similar and uh, different. 
We have come to think of, of, uh, of vampires now through sort of modern media. As the other, as we were talking about uh, uh, a few moments ago, as the other a, a, a gaunt, um, uh, pale-faced uh, East European noble in a black cape, or else as a night-ridden teenager at an American high school, because you've Twilight, you've Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you've, uh, you've people like that. But in actual fact, uh, although there are similarities, there are also differences because the cultures have been different. So we can't just categorize them like that. For example, let's say um, vampires in North Carolina are different to vampires in South Carolina. Uh, and that's because you have two different cultures. And in the North Car- uh, Carolina, uh, in the uplands of North Carolina, you have, for example, the uh, Scots-Irish who settled there. And they brought their own nightmares with them. For instance, they brought the idea, which I mentioned in the book, of the Hungry Well, where uh, the well, you do not drink from the well, the well drinks from you. And that is an old tradition from the Irish famine times. So whenever they came to settle in the uplands of North Carolina, they brought those traditions with them. South Carolina is different because the culture there uh, has uh, is different uh, and the history is slightly different. Uh, the main export of uh, South Carolina was rice. Now, these were the times of the rice kings, and you have the, you're still in the great rice plantations down there, in places like Waccamawneck and places like Merles and Let in uh, south of Charleston. So you uh, have a, a, a slave culture there who was brought to tend the rice plantations, mainly from uh, West Africa, from, uh, let's say, from around about Angola. So you have what uh, is then, uh, in that area, uh, the Gullah people. So you have the idea of vampires who are creatures which fly through the air and who can take off their skins and leave them and uh, fly out as uh, horrible things uh, and then come back and put on their skins and look just like you and me. In, uh, for example, let's say New Mexico, you have vampires who are little more than balls of light. Now, one uh, uh, here, uh, because of uh, Spanish and Native American uh, ideas, um, witchcraft and vampirism have become intertwined. And so the witch is a person who can remove their skins and uh, become a ball of light which can travel at uh, a great uh, speed and uh, through osmosis it can um, uh, uh, through something like osmosis it can draw the living uh, good out of a person and into itself because not all vampires as you know drink blood some of them drink energy uh, some of them can drink um, other, uh, human fluids, such as sweat and, uh, 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 and things like that. So, yeah, I had a lady on my show once, a guest, that said she was a vampire, but she only drank energy. Uh, well, that is quite true. And uh, there are some people who claim that uh, they know people uh, who, if you sit uh, uh, long enough with them uh, in the same area, you, uh, in the same room, let's say, or in, the same, uh, in close proximity to them anyway, um, uh, they, uh, you can get up uh, from an encounter with them uh, feeling tired and drained and things like that. Mind you, Royce, I know some people uh, who are like that, uh, who are just plain boring. And you get up and you feel drained and you feel bored and uh, and things like that. But yes, uh, there there is a belief, let's say, among the Native Americans that uh, certain people can uh, draw the good from you or can draw the good from a family, even, uh, things like that, and draw it into themselves and revitalize themselves uh, in that way. So 
once again, you have that. You have exactly the same, for example, I mentioned uh, in um, New York, uh, where a house was built on an old Dutch burying ground, because we, we think of New York as an American place, but if you look uh, sort of under the surface of New York society, you will find uh, remnants of the old Dutch, because New York was originally New Amsterdam. But uh, uh, a patch, um, uh, a patch on the floor of mold, which seemed to draw all the good of the house. And this was uh, the patch of mold was in the cellar. I remember reading about that in your book. And uh, it seemed to draw all um, the good out of the house, and so that there was no good in the house. Uh, and uh, if we can t- return for one second to H.P. Lovecraft, that is the theme of one of his stories, uh, The Shunned House, because um, uh, he uh, uh, quite obviously had heard the same story and used it as the basis of one of his own tales. I'm surprised they don't make a movie out of that, or uh, at least a show or something. <laughs> Oh, I think we should. I think uh, if uh, you and I got together, Royce, we could put a movie together. I am, uh, I am quite sure we could. <laughs> uh, there was one case in your book that stood out to me above and beyond the rest as not being just mere folklore, uh, but having some actual body to it. Uh, I mean, you have a lot of stories in here about a lot of different states, and I'm really jumping from the front to the back. But I didn't want us to run ahead. out. Of t- I didn't want us to run out of time and miss this one because uh, the actual research, the documentation behind it, uh, really kind of shows a strong case for there having at least at one time been vampires in America, and that was the very last chapter, I believe it was, uh, about these. Um, Little dwarves that were living in the, um, what do you call them, Pueblos? Or... Oh, uh, in the Pueblo, yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and you get them in, in places like Wyoming. And uh, I, uh, if you're talking about the last chapter, actually the last chapter deals with Wyoming. Wyoming, well, I, I am not long back from place. Wyoming. I was in Wyoming in November. I was in Cheyenne and uh, around that area. But, uh, yes, there are stories of dwarves and of, uh, uh, among certain Indian tribes. For uh, for example, uh, once again, the Cherokee, uh, who talk about the Nunahe, who are small men. But going back into history, you look at Coronados, um, expedition into parts of Kansas, uh, which were, uh, his cattle were attacked by little men, uh, who appeared late at night. So, uh, there may well be, uh, little men living away in the wilds, another species of human being who may attack, um, cattle, who may attack, um, goats, who may even attack humans. They, right. uh, they may be lurking under the balls of uh, North Carolina or under the mountains in Wyoming and Nebraska. It was Wyoming, by the way. Yeah, it was, yeah. The, uh, the, the, there are still stories of little men. Uh, who may drink blood, uh, as talked among, uh, the Cherokee, uh, uh the India, uh, Indian peoples. Uh, I was up, uh, around about the, uh, listening to stories from the two nations, the Shoshone and the Arapaho, uh, and they actually talked about little men who lived, uh, under some of the, uh, the hills, uh, in, uh, northern Wyoming and into Colorado. So you never know what's living in the deep gorges and uh, distant trails uh, of the Old West. Oh, that's definitely true. And one of the things that got me about this chapter is you wrote about how uh, these bodies were found in caves by explorers later on. 
and they were actually found to be a form of human, but not exactly um, like us. I mean, uh, automatically they were dwarfs and, you know, had different features, but still humanoid, in other words. Well, if you look and if you believe in the evolution, Royce, um, some people don't, uh, but if you believe in evolution, uh, you will realize that evolution has taken all sorts of weird twists and turns along the way. Uh, for example, we look at ourselves as homo sapiens, and we look at our, uh, ourselves as the only form of human on the planet. But in times past, we have not been, because there have been other branches of humans who have lived on the planet. For instance, there have been Neanderthals, uh, who were very like us, but of a different uh, of a different class of uh, of mankind. Not so long ago, in 2004, 2005, whenever they were working uh, in the Far East, they discovered the bones of uh, tiny humanoids, uh, which they christened hobbits, uh, which uh, may have fit in well with Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. But... Um, there may well have been other forms of humanoid and uh, other forms which did not uh, act exactly as we do and who had um, sorts of um, needs very different to ours, one of which may have been the need to drink blood or that they may have had low iron uh, in their bodies and they may have felt the need to uh, to drink blood or, or, or something like that. So uh, it may be um, the, the basis for uh, the idea of blood drinking uh, fairies or little men who lived uh, in the mountains of Wyoming. It may well have been the basis for uh, the idea of the chupacabra which uh, I believe is down in your part of the world, the goat suckers, uh, and things like that. So we do not know uh, what uh, way we have been in the past and what sort of different sorts of, of humans uh, have uh, existed. That is definitely, most definitely true, nor do we know of their, uh, you know, any abilities they may have had, disabilities they may have had, or, or what happened before we were here, we have little knowledge of other than the bones we find. Well, that is quite true. On, on some of the ideas of fairies and little men may have come from uh, different races who had different skills, per, perhaps through healing skills, perhaps through poisons, through, uh, perhaps through the way in which they conducted themselves and lived their lives. Uh, and uh, we, we literally don't know too much about them except that they may well have existed. And uh, so, but I think uh, we may be able to uh, touch on race memories of them through myths, through stories, uh, and through tra- uh, traditions uh, which have come down to us. Right. Uh, I, I think, for example, in my own part of the world in Ireland, about the fairies, that may be part of a race memory of other people who have lived perhaps well away from uh, ourselves, who may have been slightly smaller, uh, who may have had different ways about them, and who may, as I say, have had different skills and abilities, which we may not have. Um, I still think that things like the abominable snowman or the yeti or whatever you want to call them living in uh, the high Himalayas may be yet another uh, branch of humankind. Uh, And there are stories of men who live away in in the remote jungles and who have been put down as great apes, but may indeed be another uh, branch of humankind, you know, there's very little between ourselves and chimpanzees. <laughs> um, so we uh, 
need to approach these stories and, and say what lies behind them. And I think that's what uh, I try to do with the American vampire. And, I think you did a good job of that, in my opinion. I really do. <clears throat> and, you, you know, you covered a lot of stuff. I meant to ask you, did you actually go to any of these places in person and uh, talk to the, uh, you know, Oh, the yes. Uh, uh, I have been, uh, I was in New York, I was in, uh, the Old West, uh, not only was I, uh, writing about vampires, but I was looking at outlaws and, uh, things like that, which has always fascinated me. Um, uh, I have, uh, been to a number of, of, of places we traveled, uh, to New York, uh, I, uh, for a while uh, I was in Louisiana, and, um, so I gathered together some of the traditions, uh, and, uh, I keep a whole number of files, Royce, which I go into from time to time, uh, and, um, use some of the stuff, uh, as, the basis uh, of the chapters of the books. So yes, I was in some of the places. Other places I did read about. Uh, some of the places I haven't been. I've been to North Carolina. I haven't been up as far. I haven't actually been to Massachusetts. I've been to New York. I've been to North Carolina, and I've been very briefly in South Carolina. Uh, so, uh, and I've been to Vermont. So uh, I've been to some of the places, other places I've uh, read about or have talked to people who have been there and uh, uh, put my book together from that. Okay. Well, one more thing I wanted to mention before we call the show a wrap here is that as far as vampires go, even back in the earliest writings of the Bible, way back in Genesis, uh, God condemned, uh, you know, drinking of blood and, you know, this sort of uh, activity, uh, it would indicate that whether vampires were human or not, which if they were speaking our language, they could have been human. There was a species of human or non-human, whichever, that even back then would suck the blood from you or drain it and drink it or you know, whatever the case may be. Oh, yes, there, there was. Be no uh, the the uh, old books, which are not, uh, which are what I call non-canonical books, refer to things like uh, the creatures uh, who were related to the Nephilim. Uh, the Nephilim were the children of the daughters of men and uh, the, the fallen angels or watchers. Uh, who, had, uh, who had come down under some jaza and uh, mated with the daughters of men and had produced a legion of uh, of monsters and creatures. Right. Sorry, uh, you, you were going to say something there, Royce? No, I was saying that they were also flesh eaters, but the whole point being uh, some of their descendants could still be lurking around today. Absolutely. You never know what is out there in the night and what might be waiting for us out there in the new year. Uh, Maggie was asking if Lilith could have been a vampire. If, sorry? If? Uh, Lilith. Sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, Maggie was asking if Lilith might have been a vampire. You know Lilith of Jewish lore? Oh, the Lilith. Sorry, uh, yes. Sorry, I, 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 I didn't hear you. Uh, the name. Yes, um, uh, there, there was all sorts of creatures which came in the night. She was supposed to, be, Lilith was supposed to be the mother of all demons. Uh, but she was certainly uh, one who drew energy from you and therefore uh, should be classed as a vampire because, as I say, not all vampires drink blood. Some of them uh, draw energy, and certainly Lilith was, uh, was uh, a, a vampire or a, a monster of sorts. Yeah, I know they had talismans against her, um, and I misunderstood. Her real question was, was she a giant? I'm sorry. Oh, a giant? Uh, she could well have been because the Nephilim... 
uh, in Jewish folklore were supposed to be uh, almost uh, were giants. They were destroyed, or many of them were supposedly destroyed by God or Yahweh whenever he sent the flood to cleanse the world. But I suspect that uh, it was believed that many of them had uh, existed uh, or, or some of them had survived the flood. For example, uh, Goliath of Gath was uh, slain by uh, David, was supposed to be descended from the ne- Nephilim. Oh, the I- Bible even records that they did uh, survive the flood. Absolutely, and they, uh, they're mentioned in the Bible. So uh, Goliath is supposed to have had six fingers and six toes, as did his brothers. So there, there's all sorts of creatures lurking about, even in, in biblical lore. That is true. And in extra biblical lore, like you mentioned before, even like the uh, Book of Jeshur has mentions of stuff of this nature. Absolutely, and, and as I say, there's a whole number of uh, non-canonical books, such as the Book of Enoch and, and the Book of the Watchers and uh, books like that. Um, uh, I think uh, I might do a book on that at some stage, and we'll look at some of the biblical terrors. Uh, it could be called Holy Terrors. <laughs> <laughs> well, I show we got like four minutes remaining. Do you have any last-minute thoughts you'd like to throw in there? Oh, they, uh, well, uh, one of the things which um, I, I enjoy doing, and I, I, I really am glad that you enjoyed reading your book, because uh, American Vampires started off as a very speculative uh, thing I was sort of uh, doing, because one of the things which had fascinated me was a story from uh, which I had heard uh, from a man from Tennessee, uh, he had told me about a vampire chair, uh, and that uh, uh, fascinated me. So I looked that up, and as I say, I have, uh, in fact, said in front of me, of a whole heap of files which are <laughs> piled up against uh, the wall here, um, in which I have all sorts of ideas and, uh, and notes and stuff, uh, which is uh, possibly for future books. So I started that off, and then um, career, I had written about this on the blog, and career, whenever we were doing another thing, career got in contact with me and said, well, what are you doing, uh, who, who are you doing American Vampires for? And I said, well, look, it's yours if you want it. So they said, go ahead with it. So uh, that was the book. But uh, the vampire chair fascinated me, and the more uh, I looked through my notes, I saw that there was the basis of a book there, and um, you're sitting with uh, the thoughts, uh, my thoughts at the time, in front of you. And those are the thoughts inside the book? Sorry? I I said, oh, okay. I thought you were saying I was sitting with those thoughts in front of me. (laughs) Absolutely, absolutely. So that was how the book came about, and uh, so uh, I'm th- we're we're thinking of other uh, things. Uh, I happened to mention when I was in the states and meeting with the publishers that I had worked as a snake charmer um, many years ago in Morocco. Uh, so they said, "Would you uh, would you be prepared to write a book on on that sort of thing?" So we're looking. We're looking at the moment at a new book on on things which have um, been uh, the explanations behind some of the uh, some of the stories that were there. Because I uh, I revealed to them how to charm snakes because I was taught by the galley galley man and uh, I'd say the place called Asila in northern Morocco. Uh, and, uh, among whom I lived for a, a short time. So uh, that might be the next book. Okay, well, I'll be looking forward to having you on here to talk about it, and wh- hopefully my voice will be cleared up by then. Well, <laughs> I hope, uh, and, and think about uh, a, a, a bottle of bootleg whiskey for the new year. 
I'll definitely look into that. And in the meantime, I don't know whether you would have book, uh, bootleg whiskey down where you are. I I I, I don't know. We I certainly have a bootleg, but I can still get some wild turkey. <laughs> <laughs> I think wild turkey would be the very best. Ready. Um, well, I guess in that case, I'm going to go ahead and call a wrap on this one. I uh, want to have okay. you back to talk about your next book when it comes out. I want to thank you for coming, and my guests are in the chat room thanking you for coming. And it's been a great show. And, and it's always a pleasure to talk to you, Rice. Cro- uh, croaky or not, you're still a good host. <laughs>